Hey, how's it going, folks, and welcome to Found Flicks. On this inning, explain we're looking at VHS 94. This time, it's a SWAT team investigating a mysterious tape that leads them to a sinister cult that has pre recorded material, which uncovers a nightmarish conspiracy. It did feel like the previous entry, Viral, was designed as the grand finale for the series and showed the VHS curse spread to untold new heights. It's kind of a bummer, though, because it was definitely a letdown overall and low point for the series. It's clear with the soft reboot, VHS 94, the filmmakers slash producers are trying to return to the series' roots, and it works aces. This one wound up actually being my favorite of the entire series, and really boasts the strongest overall segments of the bunch. The only real downfall here is the dreadful wraparound, and after several baffling twists, renders it basically nonsensical. Fortunately, it's only this segment that stands out as a dud, and it's really short in the overall runtime. There's mostly new talent behind the segments, but does feature the return of Simon Barrett and my boy Timo, both on their own this time. Timo's is the brutal, gore-filled, shocking centerpiece here, and stands close to the dizzying highs of his previous safe haven. When it comes to the stories, as usual, there's lots of questions and lingering mysteries regarding each segment, and that brings us to the purpose of this video, to look at and explain everything that goes down. So let's check out VHS 94, breaking down each segment's stories and endings, as well as the wraparound. A VCR clatters, displaying a familiar blue screen, that gives way to someone panning around the room. We see a stack of TVs in a circle, hearing on the news mentions of a big burning fire. A girl inhales vapor from some goopy white substance, and the same woman is then seen with her eyes gouged out, and a recording starts to count down from 10. Seeing another woman pass by, a SWAT team is on their way to the compound, clearly under the impression that it is a drug bust related to that white goop. They bust their way into the place, and quickly figure out there's a much bigger operation than they anticipated. Even seeing a PJ there, must have some serious cash flow going on here. The woman's voice echoes, all are welcome, all are watching, tonight is the night we've been waiting for. Track my signal, the signal is a sedative, the signal is salvation. They find another guy with his eyes missing in another room, along with a TV. They also discover more of the goop, and know that they're on the right track. They next approach what looks like the outside of a house set, and inside is that main circular TV display. There are several more people with no eyes, all watching the screens. They still have a lot more ground to cover, but don't think that the girl from the tape is here, meaning that they have already seen one of the infamous tapes that make up the VHS curse. Usually not a good thing if you watch one of those. We then hone in on a screen and transition to our first segment. An anchor discusses the, at the time, burgeoning internet, and the lady laughs that she'll stick to her telephone. They then bring up a local mystery that has captured the community known as Ratman. It lives in the sewers and comes out at night. If you shine a light on it, it will disappear. They throw it to Holly out in the field, who ponders if it's merely an urban legend or is there truly an unknown creature lurking underground. Everyone has their own radically different theories. Some kids think it's actually escaped mental patients responsible, while some other middle-aged guy is certain that it's Jesus, and Ratman is here to take out all the sinners. They talk with another heavily armed man, who swears that he saw the thing himself by a nearby sewer opening. On the way back, Holly complains about the stupid story, and when asked if they need any more footage, she thinks they have more than enough. Her producer disagrees, and she caves to go in deeper, hanging up on him in frustration. They film right at the mouth, but as Jeff reminds her, they're supposed to be inside the thing. She moans that it's disgusting, and off in the distance, they are concerned by the return of the gun-toting guy. They begin to film an introduction, and are interrupted by an eerie screeching from further down the drain. They go for another take, and he zooms past her, seeing something strange in the shadows. He's certain he actually saw someone, but she doesn't believe him. They continue to walk on, and come to a homeless person's little setup, finding some old belongings along with some kid stuff. With this surprising pivot, Holly sees an opportunity for a real story, getting evidence of how the people live down here. Left to run away by the richest country in the world. Now she's the one leading the charge, calling for him to hurry it up. They search another tent, thinking this must be where the guy lives. Jeff tells her he doesn't want to mess with any of his stuff, and she promises that they just need some footage. He scans the area, and is startled by an eye opening in bed. He's freaking out, but she pushes him to keep going. They didn't come this far for nothing. The man is hugging the wall down the way, all covered in some kind of black slime. She gently approaches, and they introduce themselves to each other. She inquires, are there any other people that live down here? The man only says, rat He starts spitting up black liquid, and they decide that it is a good time to leave. As they run, we hear loud growling somewhere else in the tunnels. When Jeff stops for a moment to catch his breath, he sees that he has lost Holly. Rather than go back for her, he elects to save himself, only to encounter more sewer dwellers that quickly capture him. They both groan awake later, Holly's hands bound with plastic handcuffs. Ooh, gotta love that sewer ingenuity. She grows increasingly frightened, finding the room is filled with several others. She attempts to appeal to them, saying that she can help them get back 
back on their feet. And the story they're doing is about them. Another guy is curious how exactly she could help. Well, by telling their stories to the public. This guy steps out and he's clean and soft-spoken. And we also recognize he was one of the former interview subjects that believe Ratma was here to punish sinners. He calls her offer generous, but they're gonna tell their own story. They grab Jeff and take him over to a tunnel opening with symbols scrawled on top. The creature is there. And just as we were told, the guy wants him to cut the light. It's scaring him. He steps out and groans. And it is a truly horrifying rat-human hybrid creature. The guy takes some of the black spittle goo and proclaims this is in the name of Ratma, pouring it right over Jeff's head. It instantly causes his skin to painfully burn, which proves to be fatal. Holly is even more alarmed at the sight, begging them not to do this. He encourages that while he wasn't worthy, perhaps she is. She could be saved for all her sins. They present her to the creature. It's time to see if she's welcome to the new world. And it's not up to him to judge. That's for the new gods to do. The creature shrieks, spilling goo out all over her. It is pretty scary, I'm sure, but her face didn't get melted, implying that she has been accepted. Congrats. We're interrupted by a rogue veggie masher infomercial. It claims by crushing your produce, you unleash their full vitamin potential. Nah. Okay. We're back on the news and Holly has returned following her harrowing rescue. The rescuers are seen pulling her out covered in the same slime, appearing in a complete daze. As for Jeff, there is no sign of him. But hey, happy to have you back, Holly. She cheerily begins a story on an upcoming pumpkin festival, but keeps inserting Ratma into her sentences. She continues saying his name and begins to groan and bleed. She vomits up the black stuff all over him, which burns his skin, until gruesomely melting his entire face off. She regains her composure, casually moving on to to sports news. She then signs off, this is Holly with Channel 6 News. Hail Ratma! And an emergency broadcast message takes over. Based on what the guy said, it sounds like they're trying to create a new world led by their underground god. And how things turn out makes it look like they are well on their way. At the compound, the team continues their trek, warning that drug super labs like these can be booby trapped. They enter what somewhat resembles a church, finding a projector going, along with several pieces of mannequins in the seats. There's also a couple eyeballs that make them want to call for backup, and Spivey offers if this ends up on the news, saying that he's got a face for TV. We move to the projector screen and static takes over. At a funeral home for a younger guy, Andrew, Haley is tasked with hosting her very first overnight wake. Her boss informs her that the family has requested for the entire thing to be filmed, so make sure to keep switching out fresh tapes. Another guy, Tim, enters noticing that the casket is strangely crooked, but they brush it off as no big deal and shove it back into place. Tim calls Andrew a big boy, what's left of him anyway, learning that he died in some kind of accident. He also tells her not to worry though, he was able to fix him up pretty good, well, except for his face. The others leave and it's just Haley all alone until the morning. The funeral procession goes on and she doesn't know what to do as no one is there. About to change tapes, she decides to call her boss, telling them that she feels dumb just filming her standing around. Maybe the attendants got caught in the big storm going on, or maybe, you know, no one liked the guy. He tells her to just keep doing her job and everything will be just fine. Thunder claps and the lights blink for a moment. Feeling on edge, she calls her friend Sharon, asking her to call back if she's still up. There's another loud rumble, and she's shocked to hear what sounds like groaning coming from the casket. Ooh. She shuts off the music to listen more intently, and the phone rings. Luckily, it's Sharon. She wants to know if her mom still saves all of the papers, and asks her to check the obituaries for Andrew, as she's having a weird feeling about everything. She eventually dozes off, and another thunder blast takes out the power, completely plunging her into darkness. Certainly spooky around here with the lights out, and she tracks down a candle. Just as she gets it lit, the power roars back to life. Well, so much for that. Re-entering in the main hall, she notices the casket is somehow crooked again. She attempts to move it back into place, hearing a clear thud from within. She calls her boss once more, now certain that Andrew is still alive. He reminds her that it's just gases escaping due to the embalming fluid. He even offers for her to just take a peek. They'll stay on the line and everything, so she'll feel better. She agrees with the more logical answer here and apologizes. He says it's fine, but if she calls one more time, she's fired. Dang. Pretty serious around here. She taps the casket and quickly backs away. She tries another tap and there's knocking behind her. At least one random guy is here for the wake after all. He asks about Ronald and she informs him that she's doing the wake tonight. He doesn't really care too much as he knows no one else is coming in the storm. She asks if he's family or what and he doesn't answer taking a seat. She gives him some space and he begins to chant in a native language. He then raises his hand up and I'm assuming that means that Andrew is gonna do some rising of his own soon. After he's done, he tells her he's paid his respects and abruptly leaves. Back to 
being bored, she gets another call from Sharon. She tells her that since someone actually did show up, she's not as scared now, but she should be. As Sharon was able to find out more on his death, not in the obituaries, but on the front cover of the paper. According to the story, he spouted gibberish on the top of a church for an hour before plunging to his death, all witnessed by his family and friends. Which makes it sound like he actually did this on purpose. Hmm. The lights go out and the thudding returns. Something clatters behind her and the casket noise becomes more predominant. A heavier bang follows that moves the entire casket. She runs to the front door but finds that she can't get out. And when she turns back this time, the casket is sitting there wide open and empty. Uh oh. Tornado sirens begin to wail outside and she finds Andrew up and about facing the wall. She tries to explain to him that he was in an accident and there must have been some kind of mistake at the morgue. No, that is not the case as he turns back revealing that most of his head is gone. Woo. That's not good. She runs off and hides amongst the chairs. Since he has no eyes, she does a little test with a flashlight and finds out that he can't actually see her. She sneaks through the rows of seats quietly, but can't help but shriek when finding his hand. The sound draws him to her and she moves to behind his casket. All of his intestines start spilling out and she then finds the rest of his face, including an eye that is closed, fortunately. She tries to lure him away by turning on another camera and the eye shoots open. Now he can see her and descends upon her, hearing her flesh tearing. Just as he attacks, the tornado completely completely shatters all the windows and wrecks the place. The camera comes back on later, and Haley hobbles through the disarray, stumbling her way through the broken window. After all that, I think it's safe to say that Andrew did take his life on purpose with the specific intent of being resurrected. It doesn't make sense otherwise. It must be some kind of religious ritual that the older guy performs, yet even before that, there were some rumblings from the coffin. As for Haley's fate, it's hard to say exactly what happened. Yet she was definitely getting killed right when the storm hit. Yet we see her walking away alone, no sign of Andrew at all. So perhaps she was actually zombified like Andrew, or even was possessed by him in some way. Now a word from our sponsor, the official The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power podcast. I'm sure you're aware of the new Prime Video series, The Rings of Power, set in the world of The Lord of the Rings. I'm a huge fan of the franchise and really dug the entire season. The whole thing, including the finale, is available to watch right now. But if you're like me and get overwhelmed with all the stories, characters, the funny names, and locations, you have to check out the official The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power podcast. There's deep dives on each and every one of the eight episodes where host Felicia Day is joined by several special guests to peel back the curtain and give us an inside look at what it took to bring the world of Middle Earth to life. You'll get to hear stories and insights from the cast and crew, along with Easter eggs you don't want to miss. Each episode also features interviews with the showrunners J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay, and you know they're going to have a lot of inside scoops about the story so far and what comes next. Watch The Rings of Power on Prime Video and listen to all eight episodes of the official the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power podcast for free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app now. The SWAT team is still on the move and in another area find a child's room with tons of stuffed animals along with a smaller TV. They continue on finding some body parts, radioing in they're gonna need a grave digger. The commander is concerned that they're still split up and calls for everyone to roll call. The woman's voice starts up as they pass a room loaded with upside down crosses. All are welcome. The signal is a salvation and forever starts right now. A man comes to screeching in pain, and we see why he has mechanical spider limbs attached to his disembodied head. The electronics become unstable, and he crashes to the ground. This is all the work of mad scientist Dr. James Suhundra, who is attempting to fuse man and machine together into one. But so far, the results are less than spectacular. He's been at this for a while, narrating that Subject 97 was another failure, growing upset. He soon figures out another method to try, involving keeping specific parts of the brain active. He will try it out on two different new subjects, 98, an idea physical specimen male, and then on the female 99 SA. He brings his surgical saw to life and gets to work removing her skull. The guy happens to wake up and tries to comprehend his predicament. The doc is preoccupied removing the girl's brain, boasting easy enough when it's removed. He isn't even bothered by the guy's wailing, just annoyed that he didn't give him enough dosage, and gives him another one right in the face. There's some static, and we come into a new POV, reading live along with a battery indicator. The doc is beside himself. My child! Finally! Finally! He proclaims. He does a test to see if she can hear him, and it works. He turns on a monitor, and he can see what she is seeing through her new eyes. You're a true miracle, he says, a neo-human. He dictates that today, after many years of isolation, SA has finally proven that humans and machines can indeed be unified. Flesh and metal can coexist. He derides others that didn't believe in him along the way, calling them all fools and simpletons. He advises her if she's ever feeling sad or scared. Don't be. That means you are truly alive. He excitedly sings in his native tongue. 
young, and she tries to take in what she can of her new body. He notices and tells her to relax, getting back to work on the guy. He removes an arm and plops out on the ground, followed by his head. The signal comes back on later, and the doc is rambling about Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, the idea of pushing the boundaries of the human body. He feels akin to Da Vinci, as they are both dreamers. We then get our first glimpse of the upgrades when 98's massive blade arm malfunctions and almost gores the doctor. Woo, that's pretty excessive. On the news, there is discussion of a string of disappearances that brought further conflict between the people and police. Tensions rose further when locals found random body parts strewn in the canals. Sure sounds like the doctor. He's their number one suspect. They're still searching for one of his latest victims, and when they put up a photo of a girl with the initials SA, 99 recognizes herself. The doc is impressed as she remembers her old life, even calling it incredible. Yet to him, in order to be truly reborn, she can't remember anything about her past. So, time for some more adjustments. In the middle of doing more work, S.A. wakes up and overpowers him. She undoes her restraints, and he whaps her brutally with a bedpan. He jams it right into her face, cursing her as another failure. But things go completely off the rails when someone barks from outside to open the door. He tries to cover her up, and the cops storm the place. The commander asks him to confirm his identity, and he calls them all idiots that don't understand what he's doing here. He rants on that he can't believe they're going to arrest him, but that is not the case. They all open fire and fill him full of holes. And Commander Hassan is pissed. They're here to rescue people, not mourn a murderer. He pulls back S.A.'s sheet, and the sight of her causes him to yelp. He gets closer and straight up gags. Man, this guy's a lightweight. What, you can't handle a guy getting blasted by machine guns or human-machine hybrids? Grow up, bro. Hassan is sympathetic for the poor girl, asking Jono does he get it now, how messed up this dude really is. He doesn't even know how to describe her beyond no longer being human. He thinks she's deceased and starts to cover her up, getting quite a shock when she reaches for his arm. A guy turns a gun on her, and she weakly holds up a hand in defense. Jono tries to to stop them, believing that she is still alive. Hassan admits that might be true, but he's not bringing that thing back to her family. The lights go out, giving S.A. the chance to crawl away. Alarms begin to blare, and someone fires to get the door opened. This is a bad idea, as it triggers a huge explosion that blows them back and gravely injures a few. A recording of the doctor comes over the speakers. If you're hearing this, it means I'm dead, and he threatens that anyone who tries to take his creations shall perish here. Hassan tries to keep his men from losing it, ordering them to find the girl and kill her on sight. Jono approaches 98, whimpering, along with another guy. He comes to life, slicing the dude completely in half with his arm blade. Pretty impressive, as well as horrifying technology. He swipes at Jono, and turns his attention to the rest, slaying anyone in his path. Hassan groans for him to get out of the way, tossing the camera in his face. He launches a grenade, and as it explodes, the camera cuts out. Elsewhere, S.A. comes to, trying to get her bearings, and hearing her brother is still on the prowl. She finds the door stuck, and struggles to open it. The creature appears, and she runs right into more men that open fire. She she plummets through a hole, hearing the creature laying waste to the soldiers. The screams stop, and it stomps off. Looking around, it appears that she's found herself in the doctor's office. There are designs covering the walls and every inch of his desk. Amongst them, what looks like several gun attachments. She finds some photos of herself, indicating the doctor took some time when selecting his test subjects. Then it's time to face the real horror they've avoided so far. What does she look like now? She takes in a reflection, and the top of her head is replaced by a machine from the jaw up. She cries in horror, clutching at her metallic face and screams in anguish. She then strangely hears a girl's voice telling her hello. She follows the sounds into another room and meets what must have been an earlier experiment of the doctor's. It's much more rudimentary, just like a person bust, basically. And it is also alarming to think that he was potentially taking children, too. Or maybe it was just all robot? Back in the lab, she encounters several more twisting manglings of people and technology, his previous failures. There's one girl mid-transformation that is still alive, and S.A. gently strokes her hair. The woman asking if this is all all a dream. She puts her out of her misery, disconnecting a ribbon cable, and she shorts out to death. She spins right into a guy and fins him off with her metallic stump. But she finds out it's much more useful than that. She knocks over a table, scattering stuff everywhere, including a gun attachment that looks just like the drawings in the office. She clicks it into place on her arm port, and it powers on. She fires, and it is some serious firepower, absolutely shredding the guy. Another comes in and gets a taste, literally shooting his head to nothing but bits of flesh and bone. She wisely takes him as a shield, encountering a whole barrage of baddies. She takes them all out and tosses the body into another, and shoots him too. <laughs> a grenade is tossed, and it goes off not causing too much damage, it seems, but her gun is now malfunctioning. She changes it to grenade mode, and that works like gangbusters, exploding the guy in half. Some fool tries to go at her with a knife, and proving her handy superiority, literally rips a pipe out of the wall and jams it right through his skull. That's not gruesome enough for her, as she drags him down the wall and finally yanks the pipe right out of his face. 
Ouch! In another room, she runs into Jono. She's about to take him out like all the others, but he pleads to wait, knowing that she is that missing girl. What do you want, he asks. To live, she replies. He agrees this is a great idea and unhands him. There's still Hassan to deal with, who shoots her, sending her plummeting down a staircase. He shames him for helping her. That thing killed all your friends. He unloads the entire clip into her and pummels her mercilessly for good measure. He then yanks out cables, laughing maniacally as his face is covered in oil. Is that okay, YouTube? See, it's oil, not blood. Gunshots rip through Hassan and see that Jono has manned up. He comes to lend her a hand only to be tackled away by the behemoth 98. She boots back up to Jono being absolutely massacred. She grabs that 98's head and bashes the back of it until his juicy brains are exposed. She yanks it out, which instantly stops the monster in his tracks. Doesn't look like Jono is gonna make it though, and her signal fades away. Low battery too, shoot. Later, a security camera captures the aftermath of the massacre. Impressively, SA is still alive Alive and leaves the scene to freedom. Well, probably can't go back to her old life or anything, but there is an obvious level of sympathy for her. She didn't ask for any of this, you know? And even after more tinkering, she still did retain some part of her former human self. At this point in her horrifying journey, all she wanted to do was live. And hey, at least she got that in the end. You know? The team is still wandering around the facility aimlessly, and Gary is on edge after finding the body parts. He thought no one would get hurt, but Nash gravely tells him someone always gets hurt. She turns on another camera and faces us. Forever starts right now, she says. Well, then she must be part of the so-called drug makers here, since that phrase was in the recording at the TVs. The guy is all over the place, grunting that he hates this facility, as they pass by rows and rows of static-filled TVs. Slater can't handle it anymore, and she tells him to not lose his head. He stares at a screen, and instantly falls to his knees, slack-jawed in a trance. Man, that worked fast, and he gets to enjoy our final segment. It follows a ragtag militia group with big plans to save the soul of America, though it comes from an unexpectedly supernatural source. They gather at a small wooden house slash cage adorned with crosses outside, hearing someone whimpering within. They fling open the door, and their captive pleads, no, please! The leader, Greg, begins to recite a Bible verse, and they shoot him in the head point blank. Greg lays out his feelings about his once great country. It has now been plagued by a rotting cancer. Only he and his followers of the first Patriot Militia can save America's soul. He makes mention of a mass cleansing at hand thanks to a weapon that Christ has bestowed upon them. Thanks to him, they can truly become a righteous fist of justice. Everyone cheering and firing in jubilation. They all round up to case a building, Jimmy thinking they could walk the beast right inside. They're also concerned with trying to figure the ideal way to get inside and the position of sunlight is important. Hmm, I wonder what kind of creature they're talking about the only one that has anything to do with stun? Luckily, there's a nice sunny maintenance entrance they can get access to, deciding this is where they will roll in and detonate the abomination. They next get an important delivery from a skis ball. He compliments them on how organized they are. All they need is the artillery to pull this thing off. He reveals a truck full of all kinds of murdering weapons, including one absolutely massive one. Greg is curious just how he managed to get all this from the police station of all places. While it was easy to swipe, it turns out, their cause has friends everywhere now. Lots of cops are ready to help patrons take down the feds. And it's all thanks to Bill Clinton being in charge. Cameraman Bob asks the leader to say something about this important moment. He begins, this is but an earthly arsenal and waves on the guy that brought the goods. He heard the call from above and did his part, arming them for the conflict to come after. And he spills their big plan to topple the federal building in Detroit, Michigan. They return to their still alive prisoner and shoot him again. This time we see them draining his blood into a funnel, cautioning to not get any on you. They take a sample of the creature's blood just to make sure that it works as they want. Thusly, they inject some into a bunny and wait for the sun to hit it. They all duck and nothing happens initially until it explodes in a huge blast. They then set up a demo of how they're going to get the creature out in the building, but it doesn't go as planned. Greg thinks they have no choice but to delay their plan a day. He wants to leave nothing to chance. I mean, they're stepping on the world stage here with a metaphysical super weapon. He's not about to let Christ the King down. So one more day until they execute the bombing. But for tonight, they will cleanse themselves before retribution. Cork high and bottle deep. They have no idea what he's talking about, and he clarifies, we're gonna get wasted. Now they get it, not the brightest bunch around here, I guess. They all get absolutely hammered on moonshine and get into some serious hijinks. Bob is probably the worst off of the bunch, drunkenly stumbling down a hill. He, along with his buddy, go to harass the guy watching the cell. They wanna see the monster, and he blankly points to it on screen. They wanna go in there and, you know, mess with him. Yeah, smart idea again, drunkenly harass a vampire. They do so anyway, goofing around and egging him on to give him a kiss. 
this is not gonna go well. He leans his head and Bob accidentally gets some blood in his mouth, causing him to horribly cough. Further proving his stupidity, he eats it on the bloody floor like a total chump. Well, I'm sure this will all turn out well. In the morning, an alarm is going off and no one knows what's happening. They discover soon enough, finding another one of their guys dead with a trail of blood from his neck. Greg tells the guy manning the monster cannon to wait for a signal before firing. The creature is heard growling inside along with someone screaming and they count amongst them who's missing. Well, Steve was the one manning the cameras and no one has seen him since. They wonder if that's him screaming and a decapitated head rolls out into the snow. The gun guy starts reactively firing and accidentally takes out a bunch of their own boys, forcing them to take him out. They try to regroup and Steve comes out covered in vampire blood. They try to warn him, but as soon as he hits sunlight, he explodes. Greg wretches, looking shaken up and vows to destroy the evil abomination. They load up and navigate through the barn, hearing scraping and pounding footsteps. Bob catches a fleeting glimpse of it in the next room, so they follow after it, hearing it walking overhead. Greg sprays the ceiling and gives him an all clear. It's not so clear after all, as the creature comes down bearing a massive open face of munchers and he envelops the guy's face. Definitely not clear. Thanks a lot, Greg. Greg goes ballistic with a gun in retaliation, and the last survivors climb upstairs. They can hear the vamp darting all around the room, and then attacking Jimmy. Bob tries to help as only he can, blindly firing around the room, and wings Greg in the leg. Thanks, Bob. What would we do without you, buddy? The creature laughs at his stupidity and bears its many fangs. It then goes for Greg's face and yanks him into the cage for a change. Greg, mortified, repeatedly chants to himself, Christ is king. Ironically, if anyone could take credit for what happens next, it would be God. As sunlight begins to pour in through the windows, as soon as it touches the vampire, it ignites him in a massive burst, taking the entire place with him. So it looks like in the end, God wasn't too happy with Greg and his cohorts, using an exploding vampire to destroy federal buildings to get back at Bill Clinton. Who knew? This one feels like a riff on how people misrepresent religion in often dangerous ways. Everyone is pretty much dead at the compound thanks to the killer tapes and all have their eyes gouged out just as the others they found before. The leader guy, Slater, finds that he has been taken captive by the two girls on the SWAT team. See, told you something was off about them. They have matters to discuss with him, as he was actually the same dude who gave the weirdos in the previous segment their big stash of guns. Wow, connection between the stories, we've never had that before. Meaning that he was probably the one that took them in the first place and lets us know where his beliefs lie. Out in cuckoo land, pretty much. He doesn't understand the whole thing going on here. Isn't this a drug ring? They catch him up that it's the videos that are the villain, and they mess you up good, clarifying that it's more like a trance. He knows the rest of the team definitely aren't in any trance, and the girls reveal their real purpose here. All this was part of their latest fetish film. They're out in the world pushing weird and violent stuff, snuffing cannibals, animals, or girls in white suits fucking shit up. They also deal strictly in VHS and admit to being surprised that they were caught by their own useless police unit. They don their white suits and tell him it's time for his close-up. We're the final girls and you are our final kill. They brain him repeatedly with a camera, smashing the lens and splashing more and more blood on her face. She gets Nash to help her yank it loose out of his head and well, that guess you got what you deserve. They are all a buzz, calling this film their best one yet. Their fans are gonna go crazy. There's just one question, what to call it? As far as the wraparound goes, by the end it's kind of all over the place. Obviously these girls are behind some kind of VHS centric cult and are taking people and even children using the curse to turn them into mindless zombies. It seems their larger intent is to broadcast the curse to spread it even further. So their plan is inherently evil, but then there's the twist angle. They tracked down a guy from a tape and brought him to justice, acting more like vigilantes, which doesn't really seem to jive with their other plan. Are they good or bad? And it gets even more baffling with them working on the SWAT team. I have no idea why they would even do this in the first place. I considered maybe they went undercover to find the guy, but it sounds more like they were already on the SWAT team and then they got clued into their extracurricular activities. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Regardless, it does further strengthen the main through line of the movie seen through each of its segments. The perversion of religion in some way. Each segment presents this concept in different ways, from Ratma destroying sinners, the weird religious resurrection of Andrew, the vampire acting as the group's hand of God, and also the girls as the leaders of this VHS cult. They are all variations of the same theme. And we see that these misinterpretations typically leads to death and destruction. So, you know, don't do that. Leave the rat guy down in the sewer, you know? That brings us to the conclusion of this Inning Explained on VHS 94. And of course, we will be covering the upcoming VHS 99 sometime after its release. So keep an eye out for that. And don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at FoundFlix. What did you think of VHS 94? Which is your favorite segment? And which VHS flick is your favorite of the series? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching FoundFlix. See you next time.